insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is Episode 8. Blockbusters and Broken Hearts. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my lovely co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How you doing today, Michelle? Tired. How are you? Why Why would you be tired? I can't even imagine just looking at your shirt. Because <laughs> I did a 5K this morning. Congratulations. Thank you. So today we do have a good deal of news to get through. We have another edition of our Disney Detective and we have some insightful picks to go through. Um, are we ready to jump right in? Let's jump right in. Go for Disney Detective. <laughs> so it seems last Saturday morning there was a protest at Disneyland Paris. Uh, the company that they used to do the overnight cleaning... Um, I guess has been having some labor disputes uh, regarding wages, unfair treatment. So in protest, they basically littered the front of Main Street um, to the point where they had to have guests go a different way. They couldn't go through the the main entrance uh, to get in. And that's that's very un Disney like having very un Disney like litter all over our streets here. Yeah, they had some uh, handwritten signs in protest uh, as well, um, and there were photos of uh, from the park showing toilet paper and other debris littering across uh, Disneyland Hotel and Main Street's middle entrance, uh, which was eventually closed off to to the guests. Um, this is not the first time that this company. Uh, has protested Disneyland Paris over pay and uh, pay in conditions, a spokesperson had said. So, interesting. Nice to know that, you know, we're not the only ones that have uh, issues with, with that. Well, and that's, that is the interesting thing because <clears throat> in the United States, um, the, the, as far as we understand, the cleaning crew in Disney are actual are Disney employees. Yeah, are Disney employees. They're not out. contracted out. So, but you kind of find that with um, other parks in other countries, how um, you know they use the Disney name. It's not necessarily Disney employees in different areas are contracted out. So, I guess now this is, is Disneyland Paris owned by Disney? I believe Disneyland Paris is. Okay. Yes. So is this possibly just a European thing? Yeah, I don't know. Could be. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, interesting little uh, fun fact for uh, for Disney. Uh, so now on to Captain Marvel. Dun dun dun! Breaks the one billion globally mark. Uh, it generated three hundred and fifty-eight million in North America and six hundred and forty-five overseas. It is now the seventh film in the franchise to reach a billion dollars, and it's the eighteenth m- Disney movie to gross over a billion. Um, and the 21 films that are part of the MCU have now grossed over 18.5 billion to date. So that's that's some serious numbers there. That's not too shabby for Disney and for Marvel. Well, that explains why they can go out and basically buy everything that they want at this point in time. <laughs> basically, they they can. There's they they're not hard up for for cash. Uh, and to kind of piggyback on that, obviously, if you know you're not aware. The uh, Avengers pre-sale tickets went on sale uh, this past Tuesday morning. And, of course, lots of issues. There were um, 
Q issues with different sites like Fandango and AMC, where you would log on, it would give you a wait time of an hour, and as your time went down, all of a sudden, you got kicked out. Uh, kind of reminds us of when we were buying tickets for Comic <laughs> New York Comic Con. Yeah, it was the same that's true. Uh, type of thing. Uh, I had a friend at work who he was having that issue. He came around and you know, look, I'm at 45 minutes, and then something had happened, crapped out, and he had to, you know, go back in. Um, it's and that's the most frustrating Oh, thing absolutely, when you're like, oh, I'm so close. Um, and Fango, uh, Fandango reported that Endgame broke the first day pre-sale record previously held by Star Wars F Force Awaken in just six hours. Wow. So that's that's pretty impressive. So obviously, we got our tickets that day and i bought them what it was probably two o'clock in the afternoon yeah, yeah. had no issue i was i did it through fandango through the mobile app no problem picked our seats everything went went smoothly so. now the caveat to that is we're not going opening day we're going no, we're sunday, going sunday, sunday but weekend. still um and i didn't even look there were probably tickets still for opening day but you know, all scattered uh, <laughs> throughout the, you know, the theater. So if we wanted to go, oh, you can sit here, you can sit here, you can sit here. Yeah, yeah. if you're going as a single, it would be great. Going as a right. family, it's a going different Going as story. a family, yeah, not going to work out so well. Okay. So that is what we have for our Disney detective. So moving right along to our entertainment news of the week. So, lo and behold, Netflix is raising their prices again. Oh, my gosh. They're um, just like Disney. Oh, wait. This, this has become an annual ritual for Netflix subscribers like us. Well, at least it's only annual and not, you know, multi-annual uh, like other It's things, true. So. And, and they've not reached the point of, you know, a cable company where they're going to try and bundle a bunch of yeah, other things yeah. in to try and oh, get not, us to buy. Not too bad. And the prices are only going up a dollar or two, two dollars for the highest level, one dollar for the lowest level. That's not really unreasonable. Um, and it's not, especially when you look at the fact that Netflix had budgeted, uh, what was it, uh, eight billion uh, for new shows in 2018. Uh, of that eight billion, they, you know, they pulled down three Academy Awards and 23 Emmys. So it's, you know, you're getting volume and you're getting quality. Programming yeah, and, and that's one of the things is they're definitely up there now as a, as a major contender for good quality shows and, and movies. You can't deny it at this point. Absolutely. And, of course, this year they're going to be facing some additional competition from Apple and Disney who are both starting their own streaming services. Right, right. I don't think anyone realistically thinks that either of those companies are going to be taking a huge right. chunk out of Netflix yeah. anytime soon. Uh, just because of the, the limited amount of original content, mm -hmm. um, Disney will will be taking a bit of a chunk because they've already not renewed several right Netflix programs shows that were, and they're pulling all their movies over to their own service there. Right. So and potentially that could have some impact mm -hmm. on Netflix bottom line. Yeah. Uh, in addition to or in relation to our Netflix news, uh, the Justice Department has actually issued a. A letter, a warning, uh, a notification. I'm not really sure uh, what you call it. Variety had obtained the letter um, from the antitrust division of the Department of Justice. Um, and this was in relation to a story we had discussed on a previous podcast where uh, Netflix was going to be considering changing their qualification rules to eliminate streaming services like Netflix from being in contention. The Academy Awards, you mean. The Academy Awards, I'm sorry. They're going to be, uh, they were talking about changing the rules mm -hmm. qualification-wise to prevent companies the streaming from service to be able to... Netflix from being qualified. Gotcha. Uh, which was spearheaded by Steven, Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. Right. Um, so the, basically the Department of Justice is, I guess, getting out ahead of this one mm -hmm. and telling them, you know, behave. <laughs> mm. It'll be interesting to see what what happens with that. Yeah, it seems a little strange that they're they're taking the initiative to go after them before they even have their board of governors meeting, which isn't due to occur until April twenty third. Mm -hmm. 
before they even discuss the rule change, let alone implement it. Right, right. Uh, so it just seems, you know, for a government agency, unusually proactive. Yeah, <laughs> they're usually not not that proactive. No. Um, the next story that we have here was uh, uh, the Rolling Stones had postponed their new tour that was supposed to kick off April 20th in uh, Miami Gardens, Florida. And initially it came out with a report that it was for health reasons for Mick Jagger. Mm. Um, they didn't release a lot of information, basically a statement saying that doctors recommend that Mick Jagger not go on tour at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, Mick had then released a tweet apologizing to the fans for that, but no real information. Come to find out, he was getting heart valve transplant. Oh, okay. Uh, which was done uh, earlier this week. Mm -hmm. uh, he came through the surgery uh, with flying colors, uh, apparently is recovering fine now and hopes to be back on tour uh, soon. And, you know, for an artist like Mick Jagger, who, you know, you know, I'm a huge Eagles fan. The Eagles mm -hmm. are typically accused of loitering on stage. Right, uh, right. They basically get out there, sit on stools and play the music. They don't move right. around all that much. No, they're not one for, for dancing around. <laughs> um, but Mick Jagger, 75 oh, gosh, years yeah. old. He's always. He's all... a blur up there. Right, yeah. So, and I can only imagine the. The stamina, in fact, one of the comments that I had seen basically attributed his success with the operation and his expected recovery, quick recovery, to the fact that the man has kept very good care of himself. Well, yeah, and that's the thing is, you know, I'm sure he's, he's, he's well um, pickled with all of the alcohol and uh drug paraphernalia that's been in his system, but he's always been very active. Anytime you ever see anything from any concert running around the stage, yeah. you know, always moving about. So yeah, like you said, that's probably why he did so well with the surgery. Yeah. So well, we wish him well. And uh, it sounds like he's, he's already on his way to a speedy recovery. Yeah. Uh, next we have uh, Celine Dion. Uh, has announced that she'll be releasing a new album called Carriage and will embark on her first world tour in over a decade. Wow. Um, she's ending her Las Vegas residency, which, to my surprise, mm -hmm. she was there for 15 years, and it did not seem like 15 years. No, it didn't. It definitely didn't seem like it had been that long. Um, she'll, of course, be kicking off the tour in her hometown of Quebec, Canada. Of course, you have to go home. Um, on September 18th, the tour is uh, scheduled to make over f st uh, stops in over 50 cities, and she's expected to release her 12th album uh, in November. Mm. Um, when, when asked, uh, she had indicated she felt motivated to create new music and get back on the road again since the death of her husband and manager, whose name I will not try to pronounce <laughs> because I can't. Uh, but he passed away in 2016, and he had been with her for decades. Yeah, since she was a, a teenager. Yeah. So so that's, that's, you know, I could certainly relate to the fact that that's a difficult loss to, to mm -hmm. come back from. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and to pick things up and, and get back on on the road again. Mm -hmm. Especially after you spent 15 years in Vegas. There has to be a certain comfort level there. Oh, I'm sure. Plus, you know, she has the three boys. Or the three, yeah, three boys. Um, you know, so I'm sure. Um, I'm not sure how old the youngest ones are. Um, but I'm sure this will be a, a nice opportunity to get out and not be, you know stuck in Vegas anymore. Yeah, this will be the first world tour since her Taking Chances world tour in 2009. So she took quite a bit of time off from touring for that. Yeah. Uh, she's only 51. She looks fantastic for mm -hmm. 51. Definitely. So she's got a very long and storied career ahead of her. Uh, mm -hmm. She's still got her voice, still got her oh, looks. Oh, absolutely. She's on top of the world, I think, once she gets out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she'll do well, I'm sure. Um, that was all the news that we had for okay. this week. I think we're a little ahead of schedule, actually. Uh, I think we're safe to move on to our insightful picks of the week. Let's do it. So, 
So each week we go through the various things that we consume as far as media and entertainment. We pick something that we think the audience would like. We call that our insightful pick of the week. And as always, I will bow to you to go first, my dear. Why, thank you. Guess what? It's not from Netflix. That's astonishing. <laughs> Is that because they raised their prices? Yes, I'm. I'm backing <laughs> off of Netflix. Actually, I'm. I'm not. Actually, I'm very. You know, very, very happy with Netflix, and always a surprise to to log on to it and and see something new or a new season of a show that I've already uh, started watching. Um, but the show that I'm actually doing for my insightful pick for this week is a show, a new drama, family-ish drama, on uh, Tuesday nights on NBC called The Village. Uh, it followed This Is Us, which happens to be one of my favorite shows as well. Um, and since This Is Us had their season finale last week, I believe this is now going to take over the This Is Us time slot. Um, going forward for the next couple of weeks, obviously, while it's on. Um, so basically, it's, like I said, a family drama that takes place in Brooklyn. And the setting is, is an apartment complex, uh, an apartment building. And it's basically following the lives of the different tenants that are there. So you have um, the one woman who's a single mom with a very creative teenager who is a nurse and then you have the one law student who now has his grandfather moving in with him then you have a immigrant uh, mother uh, who's recently divorced who has some trouble with uh, immigration um, then you have a, a veteran who's now returning from war and has a bit of a uh, secretive past that is starting to come out um, and then kind of the matriarch and patriarch of the apartment building, the older couple that basically they're the glue that keep everybody together and everybody looks out for everybody um, is there and, and they're kind of the heart and soul of the building. Um, so it, it goes through the different challenges and, and stories, you know, that each, you know, is facing. And, and it's just, you know, it, it's one of those... You don't have to think too much. You kind of just sit back, watch it, relax, enjoy it. Not as much of a tearjerker as, say, a This Is Us, but definitely entertaining if you're into those type of, of shows. You know, a little bit of comedy here and there, um, but mostly just, you know, a, a decent drama to, to watch, you know, at the end of the day, uh, relaxing uh, before heading off to bed. Very cool. Sounds like a good pick. Thank you. Thank you for your pick. My pick this week is a, going to go in a slightly different direction, which I often tend to do. Uh, I'm going to actually uh, put out a podcast that I listen to that you have turned me on to, my dear. Oh, my. That's that's how many of your insightful picks have been something that I've... Yeah, I'm a, I'm a cultural swine. I okay. know. I don't, I don't watch anything <laughs> on my own. It's, it's okay. I can admit to that. That's good. So this podcast is called Undressed Historia, produced by Margot Collins. Uh, it is the official description as each episode of Undressed Historia takes one woman from history and discusses her life and impact. Why were certain women remembered a specific way? And should their legacy be different from what popular history dictates? Um, there's currently six podcasts in here. Uh, there's a couple of podcasts that are two-part podcasts, mm -hmm. but generally they don't go over a half hour. Um, what I really enjoy about the podcast is that Margot delves into a detailed historical analysis mm -hmm. of these women. Yeah. And it's not what you would typically see in any other documentary or read in a history book. There's that. Because, you know, you can't get around the fact of the historical significance of a Cleopatra. Right. Um, but after reading, um, or rather after listening to the podcast, you, you walk away almost feeling like a personal connection to these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the level of detail that Margot goes into, she explores the characters. And I say characters, I mean they're historical figures. Mm -hmm. She explores them in a way that humanizes them mm -hmm. 
and it it makes them real people. Yes, Cleopatra is you know a, a monarch. She's a huge historical figure. She's played a huge role in so many important things that happened in history. But she was a person, mm-hmm. and she was a woman, and she was a woman in a time what? when women didn't do what she did. Right. Um, so a lot of what what the podcast goes into are some of the challenges, some of the conflicts, um, but some of the personal details that you run into. Mm-hmm. And and when you finish listening to it, you, you almost feel like you could sit down and talk to this historical person, mm-hmm. whereas typical history recounts of such figures place them on a pedestal right where they're to be observed but not interacted Mm -hmm. with right right um and she she does a fantastic job in her detailed uh research into each of these topics multi-sourced she draws her own conclusions she's not she's not pulling a conclusion out of a history book Mm -hmm. so she pulls multiple sources together draws her own conclusion but I think more importantly, invites the listener to draw their own conclusion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, here's all the facts. Here's what I think the facts mean. Right. What do you think the facts mm-hmm. mean? Uh, it's a very engaging uh, podcast that when you when you finish it, you you don't feel like you know more information necessarily as much as you know the person. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a very unique take on on history and mm-hmm. historical yeah. figures. Yeah. Um, Undress Historia can be found on all the major podcast distributions, including iTunes, Stitcher, and Pod Paradise. You can subscribe directly to the podcast at undressedhistoria.podbean.com, or you can find the podcast on Twitter at history underscore pod, or on Facebook at Undressed Historia Podcast. And that's my pick of the week. Very cool. So I think that will wrap us up this week. I think it does. Um, We'll be back next week with uh, another great podcast. Okay. Thanks for joining us, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone.